15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello, once again, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the Space Nuts Podcast. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me again, as always, unchallenged and generally because we can't get anyone else to do it, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer <laughs> at large. Hello, Fred. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, we've, we're good. finally being hit by some pretty hot weather out our way, and uh, we're getting yeah. temperatures uh, up around 38, 39 going into the weekend, so... Looking forward to that. You'll have a ball. Oh, look, it, it's just yeah. a weird time of year because uh, you go from freezing cold to boiling hot in a matter of a day and then it goes back again. But, uh, yeah, we're starting to get into that seriously warm time of year in central New South Wales and, of course, that means fires. So, they're um, yeah, they're on ready alert for that. Uh, the, the fire season starts in the north and moves down. So by New Year and into next year, it's all Victorian, South Australian problem uh, areas, but uh, we, we are just about to come into our fire season. So, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm currently 200 kilometres to the south of you, or thereabouts, something like that. Yeah, yes. in in the capital, the national capital, Canterbury. Canterbury, yeah. No, Canterbury. <laughs> they can't do anything. It's Canberra. No, 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 well, they can. Yeah, of course they can. <laughs> they pay me for a start. Yeah, well, they do. They used to pay me, but no more. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. Um, well, well, you better tell us what you're doing there before we go through this week's program. It's actually mostly meetings. So uh, I've been in meetings today. I was in meetings yesterday. There is uh, tomorrow a farewell, little farewell celebration for somebody who uh, has been um, in, in charge of the division within, within which I work, and she's a very important person in my life because she is the person who decided that they needed an astronomer at large. Uh, so, yep. Uh, but she's moving, not actually from the department, she's moving divisions. Okay. But we're still having a farewell party for her, so oh. uh, that's another good reason for being here. So that'll be tomorrow. Nice. Morning. Public service cake, always stale. Oh, it'll be excellent. Yes, public service cake. <laughs> now, t- today, Fred, uh, we're going to talk about that recent launch by SpaceX that sent four oh, yes. astronauts to the International Space Station, which was a fabulous achievement. Uh, achievement. I watched the launch. It was uh, very exciting. Uh, and and th- another interesting, speaking of rockets, uh, idea, this is sort of um, in development, but only on paper at this stage from what I can tell, but they're, they're, they're looking at using old rocket bodies uh, which could potentially be used as space stations or as, as uh, laboratories in orbit or, or things along those lines. Uh, I really love that idea. It sort of uh, dovetails well with something we talked about a few uh, episodes ago where, you know, in the future they might hollow out asteroids and make them livable. Well, this is something similar and probably more practical at this point in time. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, a little bit of um, backwards analysis uh, about uh, some of the things uh, like um, protein structures that are, re- are responsible for um uh, potential life and, and where they might have been early on and, and they uh, are in places you wouldn't uh, have thought that they would be. But we'll talk about that. And a couple of questions, one from Misty West uh, about interstellar travel, and it's nice to hear a, a lady's voice for a change on the podcast, and another question about um, cataloguing stellar phenomena, which I think would be um, a, a pretty tough job, but maybe not. So let's begin, Fred, uh, and the uh, the launch of uh, SpaceX of four astronauts into space, uh, and they've been dropped off at the International Space Station. They just opened a hatch and said, "Just go down there, hop in." Yeah, yeah that's right. So uh, no, look, the, the reason why this is a a, a major milestone uh, is that this launch of four astronauts uh, on their in their um, uh, Dragon Crew, oh, sorry, Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, this is the first, basically the first routine uh, service, taxi service of astronauts to the International Space Station, courtesy of SpaceX. 
Uh, and so it's really quite a milestone. So we, we saw a few months ago um, the two the first two astronauts to be sent up to the International Space Station in a crew dra Dragon capsule. They were the, the sort of first test crew. Uh, but what we've seen today is the first routine crew, four astronauts. Uh, there are three Americans and one Japanese astronaut, and they will join two Americans and one sorry, two Russians and one American who are already on board the International Space Station. And if you add those up, it comes to seven. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the, that's the number of astronauts on board at the moment. Uh, the International Space Station was designed to uh, to, to hold six astronauts. Okay. So, so someone uh, there sleeps is a, in the closet. The, more or less, probably sleeping in the, in the Dragon, the Crew Dragon capsule. Possible. Which might actually be a bit more roomy than the, um, you know, than the accommodation space in the International Space Station yeah, itself. They, they could to. toss a coin to decide who it is, but it wouldn't come down. <laughs> it would just keep spinning. Yes. That's right. Mm. Yeah, great stuff. So it's it's a milestone. It, you know, it's not a big story, but it's a great it's great news for uh, for the the well being of of spaceflight generally, but also for NASA's plans. Uh, to use uh, commercial services in order to do a lot of the what you might call the donkey work in the you know in the space exploration field. Oh, I'm sure Elon Musk would love you calling it donkey work. <laughs> All right, somebody's the, got to do it. Yes, the, somebody's got to do it. Work. The service right. work, the uh, the taxi service, whatever you want to call it. Uh, do we know what they're going to be doing up there? Uh, I, I think it's routine experimental Rex experimentation stuff i believe and i haven't checked this up uh but i believe that um, they've already some of them are, have already had a an extra ver vehicular excursion oh nice and, uh, which is getting outside with your spacesuit yes on, floating yes. around it took a long time it was a 27 hour flight why did it take yeah, that long right. uh it's a great question and it's actually one that's on my horizon because somebody pointed out to me yesterday uh that the soyuz capsules seem to get up there a lot faster yeah. than the crew dragon ones uh, and I, but i think they, it use, may they be... use vodka in their fuel that's, that's <laughs> probably <laughs> gives it higher octane um the uh i think the the deal really uh, is about the individual situation where you you know whereabouts the the international space station is in relation to the launch station you've got to match orbits and things yeah. of that sort um but i i will explore that further because mm. my inkling too is that these flights seem to be taking longer to get to the space station than they did in the olden days it's maybe by the olden days i mean um three months ago yeah. or something um it's um it's uh it, it may just be an impression a false impression that we didn't really get the details of how long it took with science. well it took them 27 hours to get yeah, uh, yeah. how far into orbit 500 kilometers or something yeah and I mean, and and that's that's slower than a dreamliner takes to get from perth to london not at the moment though but you know what i mean that's right um so the, but just to to sort of correct the impression there i know to to get to to get into orbit is only about 10 minutes um and the rest of it is basically aligning orbits and you know making sure that your 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 uh the orbit of the spacecraft intersects with the orbit of the international space sure. station because that's the and, that's and the, missing all the space junk while you're at it you've got to miss the debris as well yeah. yeah all right well they're up there it's good and the private sector playing a very big part in space travel and exploration these days and space tourism for that matter um, while we're talking about spaceships uh, launching into space, there are many that have done that and left their junk behind. We've talked about space junk just now, but uh, there are rocket stages that get used and then they become useless uh, once they um, once they uh, are cast off. But now there's uh, there's there's some thinking that well. These things could be useful in the future. We could we could refit them and make them into habitats, or we could make them into space stations, or we could make them into laboratories. What's all this about, Fred? It's uh, an old idea whose time might have come, mm. uh, because you're quite right that uh, when you launch a spacecraft uh, into orbit, um, 
you've got the, the the main booster, and that's the bit that now SpaceX have perfected the the technology of getting them back down to Earth safely, so they can be reused. Yeah. Uh, that that always comes back to Earth. Uh, it used to be that it all it fell into the ocean or onto the steps of Asia, but now it falls uh, back, at least in the in the SpaceX um, missions, it, it falls back under control, usually onto that uh, barge with the delightful name of. Um, you know, I, uh, I, what was it? Oh, I said, I, I said, I still love you. No, it's not quite that, but it's something like that. Of course, I still love you. That's it. That's the name of it. Uh, and I think that he, I think Elon Musk has two of those. The other one's called Just Read the Instructions, <laughs> which I love as well. He's a, a great head, isn't he? <laughs> well, he's certainly got away with words. Yeah. But so, so what you've got is these first stages come back, and then the upper stages usually remain in orbit. Um, often the second stage, which is quite large, you know, these things are often several metres in diameter and even more metres long, and they're perfectly good pieces of engineering. Um, so for many years, people have uh, looked at these things and said that's a, a waste of a perfectly good giant metal tube. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's in orbit, uh, and there is a company called Nanoracks, which I, I confess I haven't heard of before, um, whose uh, CEO is a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Manber. Uh, and he said, he says NASA has looked at the idea of refurbishing fuel tanks several times, uh, but it was always abandoned, usually because the technology wasn't there. Uh, in fact, actually, Werner von Braun, the, you know, the, the kind of uh, the architect of, of NASA's rocket program back in the 50s, he suggested doing this as well. He suggested um, going up to, to, to grab a, a, a spent Saturn five second stage yeah. and turn it into a habitation module for astronauts. Um, so the idea has been there for a long time. Um, it basically is now, as I said, it's an idea whose time has come. This company, Nanorax, has got a program called Outpost, which is designed to give these uh, rockets essentially a second lease of life, uh, probably probably uncrewed uh, space stations, but maybe eventually, uh, you know, bigger space stations that could actually host humans uh, and maybe made by connecting several rocket stages that are already in orbit. That's the trick. You've got these things already in space uh, and it's much easier to send up a, 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 a robotic um, mechanical device that will actually modify the rocket, the, sorry, the, the, the orbiting rocket body. It's much easier to do that than send another orbiting rocket body up. That's the philosophy anyway. Um, so uh, there is uh, another uh, quotation from actually the project manager at uh, Nanorax, a uh, person by the name of Nate Bishop, who says... Uh, what they are planning is several small in-space demos uh, before they attempt to convert, you know, the full upper stage uh, into something that you could describe as a space station. And um, Nate Bishop says, right now, we're not really modifying anything. We're focused on showing we can control the upper stage with attachments. Uh, but in the future, just imagine a bunch of little robots going up and down the stage to add more connectors and, uh, you know, small propulsion units, solar panels, all of that sort of thing. Uh, you, you can kind of imagine that happening. Yeah. Uh, one of the first tricks, though, that you have to do is that often these uh, these rocket bodies, the upper stage rocket bodies, they're not their fuel is not exhausted because you always want to have a bit in reserve mm. to make sure you put the spacecraft in the correct orbit. So there's uh, often remaining fuel in these <laughs> rocket bodies. So the last thing, you know, you don't want to start tinkering around with a welding torch uh, while you've got uh, un unused fuel inside. Yeah, I it. can't so you... see in here. Somebody strike a match. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, a bad idea. So, the, you know, the first task really is to clear them of their unused fuel. And then it's a really interesting suggestion. And I think their first uh, plan, if I uh, remember rightly from uh, when I read about this, is to actually um, do some experiments as early as May next year. So that would be very interesting. It's, uh, you know, it's not 
that far down the track and it will be really nice to hear about somebody recycling a rocket body uh, to make it useful. And of course, if you can put a propulsion unit onto it, you can probably uh, avoid collisions because all these things this sort of size are tracked by radar uh, and you, the last thing you want is another one banging in banging into you so a little propulsion unit might avoid that happening indeed uh, and as you said they're quite spacious and that is a big advantage and they're really tough so that they've already got um i don't know prefabricated um opportunities yeah. and and it, it, it it might become economically viable to do this in, in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, that's, that's you know, right. Just reuse some of this old junk, that, uh, like, like they do shipping containers. You can, you can make houses yeah, exactly. out of them. And things. <laughs> you can. I lived in one for a Did while. Did you? <laughs> well, it was, it was at um, Siding Spring Observatory after the oh, Siding yes. Spring Lodge burned down. We had a whole series of what are called dongers because they're used in the mining industry. Right. And they call them dongers there, but they converted shipping containers. And I can tell you it was awful, oh. uh, mainly mainly because, um, as you've just been mentioning, uh, in central western, northwestern New South Wales, hot. it can get pretty hot. Yeah. And even with an air conditioner, it's hard work uh, living in one of those. Yeah, things. I worked for a radio station once that uh, used one as the radio announcer's office. <laughs> right, okay. And it, it was a pretty <laughs> tight affair it was decked out with desks and audio equipment as you can imagine but we essentially worked outside that nobody likes announcers they've got you know, send them out there into that box <laughs> uh, it was always very cold because they had a, a air conditioner in it that was way too big for the job so it was freezing even in the heat of summer but worst worst of all is that a couple of the guys had their own coffee percolator so the place always stunk <laughs> like of old coffee i mean i love coffee but that stuff doesn't do very well in a tight space. So, <laughs> coffee is one thing that you shouldn't be recycling. Really. <laughs> no, unless you want to feed the coffee grounds to worms, they love it apparently. Well, they, they do, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, shipping containers and spent rocket bodies are eminently recyclable. Indeed, they are. Yes, you're listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Thanks for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast, Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. And, and thanks to our patrons who continually support us financially. We appreciate the, uh, the few dollars a month that you put in or maybe more. And, of course, I uh, mentioned a couple of times recently that you can actually buy a 12-month subscription ahead of time and you only have to pay for 10 months, which means one of us can't work for two months, but... We'll, we'll toss a coin on that one too. But no, thank you. If you want to find out more about becoming a patron, you can do that uh, on our website, spacenutspodcast.com. All the information's there. You can do it through Patreon, Supercast or Acast, uh, whatever way you choose. Uh, and, of course, as a patron, you get extra benefits, which uh, I'm sure you're aware of. So thank you again for supporting the Space Nuts podcast. Now, Fred, Let's talk about this, um, this, this, this research paper that's been released, I'm, I'm gathering, uh, and it's all about the, uh, the origins of protein structures re responsible for metabolism. So I'm going to dumb it down to uh, precursors for potential life that they've found could have existed in places where you wouldn't expect to find it, such as the cold, dark vacuum of space. Was I right? Well, yeah. Yeah, you're right on the money there, Andrew. That was a lucky um, guess. Yeah, so we can move on to the next segment now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a little bit more to the story. Um, so uh, in particular, what we're talking about is the simplest amino acid, which is glycine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's already known in space. It's been found in comets. In fact, the famous comet Churium of Gerasimenko that you and I spoke about many years ago, visited by the Rosetta spacecraft, uh, which was a European Space Agency mission, otherwise known as 67P, the comet, uh, that um, was uh, shown to have glycine in, in its, basically embedded in, it, in its ice, the ice of which it's made. Um, there's also, uh, there is also um, evidence of glycine in, uh, some of the, um, you might remember, there were missions called Stardust that brought oh, back yes. 
samples of, of stardust, essentially, interstellar dust, and there were amino acids in that. Um, so that's basically an, a known quantity. And glycine, we know, is a is a one of the important, really important building blocks of life. And it's out there. Mm. That much we know. But what's interesting is how did it get there? And, and when did it form? And so we know from the fact that it was found in the uh, in the ice of a comet, uh, Comet 67P, uh, we know that that means that it was around at the very dawn of the solar system because the comets are uh, basically the, 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 the last vestiges of the icy, dusty cloud from which the solar system uh, formed. Uh, comets are... You know that that as I said, they're mostly ice with dust uh, in them as well, uh, but they're just the frozen relics of of the molecules which were around when the solar system was formed. So we know that glycine is very old, but what's new and the reason why this story uh, is in the headlines uh, and it's research that was done. Uh, both at uh, Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands and at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, it's how the, the, the glycine was formed because the common wisdom has always been that in order for this molecule, the glycine, to form, you need energy in the form of probably ultraviolet radiation from stars. In other words, you've got to have a nearby star that's irradiating its surroundings, including clouds of gas and dust, with ultraviolet that kickstarts the reactions that form glycine. That's been the conventional wisdom. But this new work uh, has shown that you don't need that, um, that in fact there's enough energy just by atoms whizzing into one another in these dark clouds to form the, 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 the these complex molecules. Um, there's a, a, a comment. So this is being called dark chemistry, chemical reactions without the ultraviolet radiation that you thought you needed. Uh, and one of the scientists at Queen Mary University uh, has commented on this work and says, dark chemistry refers to chemistry without the need of energetic radiation. In the laboratory, we were able to simulate the conditions in dark interstellar clouds where cold dust particles are covered by thin layers of ice and are subsequently processed by impacting atoms, causing precursors, precursor species to fragment and reactive intermediates to recombine. That last sentence means it kickstarts reactions, basically. Um, and the fact that you've, you've got bombarding atoms that are enough to do that. So um, essentially, they, they've demonstrated with um, these rather sophisticated experiments using ultra-high ultra vacuums and atomic beam lines uh, that you can actually, uh, they've managed to form glycine uh, by processes like the ones that we've just described that don't involve stars being there. So uh, why is that interesting? Uh, well, it basically suggests that perhaps uh, molecules like glycine are more common in the universe than we thought, because if you've got a cloud of dust and gas uh, with the raw materials, the hydrogen, the carbon, uh, the nitrogen in, within them, um, then these molecules are actually inevitably going to bond together. You don't need the, the, to have a nearby star that's uh, kickstart, kickstarting or perhaps supercharging the, the reaction. You can do it with darkness, which is really why this term dark chemistry is one that uh, is very appropriate. Mm, indeed. Uh, what interests me is that with the work they've done thus far, they're going to be able to do more experiments that might actually give clues as to how life developed on Earth because we really still don't know where it came from. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, there's there's um, more comments actually from some of the authors that um, – uh, I like um, this one from uh, Harold Linartz, who's the, actually the director of the Astrophysics Laboratory at Leiden Observatory. The important conclusion from this work is that molecules that are considered building blocks of life already form 
at a stage that is well before the start of star and planet formation. Such an early formation of glycine in the evolution of star-forming regions implies that this amino acid can be formed more ubiquitously in space and is preserved in the bulk of ice before inclusion in comets and planetesimals that make up the material from which ultimately uh, planets are made. And then, you know, they go on to say that glycine then becomes a precursor to other complex organic molecules. And it may even mean that, you know, that not life itself, but really the, the raw materials of life are, are available long before the formation of a planet like the Earth. Mm. And, yeah, so maybe we did come from outer space ultimately. Well, it stands to reason that everything you need to create life is probably out there and it's just yeah. a matter of it mixing up in the right formula in the right place at the right time under the right conditions and boom there you are now you've got it yes that's right which is going to upset the creationists i guess they're upset anyway but you know i, I suppose you can also introduce other theories as to what do you define as creation i mean maybe that was the plan well We've certainly got very good evidence that the universe was created in an event called the Big Bang. And we don't know why that happened. And we don't know why that happened. Exactly. That's right. mm. It is fascinating. But, uh, yeah, there, there, there'll be a lot more to learn from the information that they've released. And if you want to go hunting for it, it'll be in one of those strange little places where all these reports and, and information is stored. I think they actually uh, have told us where that one is. And I have... I, well, yes, I think it was Nature. Uh, yeah. Um, Nature Astronomy. That's right. That's the journal. That's the one, yes. Yeah, indeed. Nature Astronomy, one of the well-known journals. You can. It's amazing how easy these days it is to find these learned papers. They're all on the interwebs. They, they are indeed on the interwebs. Mm. You can even find one or two by Fred Watson. <laughs> More than one or two. I, I suspected that. <laughs> I suspected there might be at least five. <laughs> yes, yeah, five. It's about five. <laughs> Actually, I have to say that if you did a search in, on these archives, you'd probably find a lot where um, you've got papers with a list of fifty authors, and Fred Watson is the last one. But because <laughs> it's one, well, because you start with W. One. W. That's right. <laughs> also, if you're looking for Fred, always start at the bottom. Start that's at the where end. He's yeah. at, home, at the bottom. <laughs> Right down yeah. the bottom. Uh, this is the Space Nuts podcast, episode 229, by the way. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do, and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, do you really want big tech companies, governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... 
back to the show. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Now, if you are thinking, what will I get somebody for Christmas? Dad's really hard to buy for. Uh, you can go to the Space Nut shop uh, and, and check out uh, some of the goodies there, uh, the T-shirts, the hoodies, the underpants. No, we haven't got those. Uh, but we've got caps. Uh, we've got mugs. We've got all sorts of things. And, of course, you can then check out a couple of great books by the one and only Fred Watson and a couple of not-so-great books by somebody else who's so sitting next to him at the moment in a virtual sense. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say they're not so great books. I think they are I, definitely great books. I'm um, well into my next one. I've been writing feverishly. I, I've I've got a bit of a problem, though. I've got so many storylines uh, operating in three different time frames and I've got to try and converge them all and tie them all up and I, I actually don't know how I'm going to do it yet. <laughs> But um, I've already thought of the big twist. Uh, oh, good. The big twist is good. is going to be a, a real ripper. Uh, so um, I've just got to find a way of tying these storylines together so that the whole thing just goes boom and then there'll be a twist. That's the theory anyway. So, um, yes, uh, spacenutspodcast.com, have a look at it. Uh, don't forget while you're there to um, uh, sign up for Astronomy Daily and uh, you can also send your questions to us via spacenutspodcast.com. Uh, and speaking of questions, Fred, we have a, a couple that we need to uh, go through and uh, let's hear from our first listener. Hello, Andrew Dunkley and Professor Watson. I'm Misty West, and I live on a little farm in western Pennsylvania, U.S. I love your show, and I can't wait for a new episode each week. I have a question about space exploration. It seems like, for now at least, human space exploration beyond our solar system isn't possible. I wonder if we could rather use tiny quantum computers on small space probes and then send those out to other planets and solar systems and other parts of the universe to explore them. Sort of like the Voyager probes, only smaller and lots more of them. So with quantum computing, wouldn't it be possible to create like holographic images from faraway destinations? And so it would be like we were there and then we could send images back as if, as if we were at the destination. And then I was reading some work by Carlo Rovelli, and he was saying that the quantum world isn't subject to time. So theoretically, couldn't we send a probe out and almost instantly receive data back in our time? I mean, like maybe with some cosmic breadcrumbs or something along the way. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to wait 200 years for a probe to reach planetary system and then 40 more years for data to come back so because I'm not patient like that so I'm sure there are obvious reasons this can't happen but for me it's fun to think about and I have no idea if anything like that is even possible so thanks for reading my question and I hope that you can help me answer that wow uh yeah that that throws up all sorts of cans of worms um Notwithstanding the first problem, we don't have quantum computers yet, uh, but we do have the concept of interstellar space travel using uh, laser technology and those little micro spaceships that they've been talking about, Fred. But as Misty points out, um, that's the slow way. Well, actually, yeah, the, the slow way is to use... Chemical rockets, which is that's even really all we've got at the moment. Um, and if you do that, um, yeah, the nearest star system, the Alpha Centauri system, uh, it's not two hundred years you're talking about; it's sixty thousand years uh, to get there no. at about 20, 20 kilometers per second. So what you've got to do, yes, is accelerate your spacecraft to a significant fraction of the speed of light. And the project that you're thinking of, you're absolutely right, these little micro spacecraft powered by laser beams using light sails, that's being investigated uh, as part of the Breakthrough Foundations initiative, which has been running now for about five years. And it may this particular one may be finished, but it was to do uh, essentially a, a feasibility study on the idea of using uh, light sails with little micro spacecraft 
and lasers, high-powered lasers, to boost these light sails to a speed of typically a third of the speed of light. Uh, this was called Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, it's oh, a project right. fun funded by Yuri Milner, a, a Russian entrepreneur. Um, I, it, it may or may not still be running that project, but uh, it's the idea itself is certainly feasible, that if you can use a laser to accelerate your light sail with its tiny spacecraft, and it, literally they're talking about this sort of size yeah. for those spacecraft. Uh, and I can do that because we've got video, video now. now. So <laughs> for those without video, it's about an inch. Yes. <laughs> or 20, 25 um, millimetres. 25 millimetres, Those on yeah. the side of the planet. Uh, that's right. So the those spacecraft, the, the you know, the idea is for, uh, plausible that, yes, you can wind the thing up so it's heading off away from Earth at maybe 100,000 kilometres per second, a third of the speed of light. So what that means is um, that you, assuming the acceleration phase is very quick, which would be the plan, you get your spacecraft to the Alpha Centauri system in roughly... 16, 15, 16 years, something like that, um, you you can't decelerate it. You can, you've got no way of slowing the thing down. So it has to zoom through the system. And you probably have whole fleets of these things, not just one. You've probably got you know hundreds of them, this little flotilla of miniature spacecraft, exactly as Misty suggested there. Um, they zoom past and take their pictures, send them back. The images take another four years to come back uh, because they're traveling at the speed of light and it's 4.3 light years away. So you're talking about of order 20 years to get your images back, which is kind of tract tractable. And even impatient people, assuming they're not um, in the same generation as I am, uh, I've probably got that length of time that they can wait to see the, the images. I'm hoping I have too, yes. but that's a different story. <laughs> um, however, you know, the really interesting aspect of this question, I think, is, is the bit that Misty raises about quantum processes. And quantum computing um, is, as you say, Andrew, it's still in its infancy. It's something that a few companies have claimed to have got workable co quantum computers, but they're certainly nowhere near the stage where you can sit one on your desk and do mammoth co computations. Mm -hmm. And they also, they're focused really on using the, um, the, the sort of uncertainties within uh, quantum physics. In other words, the, the fact that uh, a, a thing like an electron can be in several different states at once. Yeah. So your quantum bits can be either on or off or anywhere in between them, the qubits as they're called. So that's very much the focus of quantum computing. But the idea of quantum physics operating independently of time really goes down to uh, what's called quantum entanglement, uh, which is where you've got two um, subatomic particles and you combine them so that they behave like a single quantum entity. Uh, and the, there may be photons of light, for example, that are shot from the same laser, and they can be in this state of entanglement. So if one of them is taken one way and the other is taken the other way, even though they're physically separated, they seem to be entangled in such a way that if you modify one, the other one instantly reacts. Um, and that seems to defy the laws of relativity, which say that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. There are some very strict limitations on how that would work, though, and it's not quite uh, signals traveling faster than the speed of light. It's, it's much more about the way causality works. There's some deep philosophical, uh, you know, thinking required in that. Yeah. And so I can't imagine, even thinking about quantum entanglement, I can't imagine how you would um, use that in order to send signals back instantaneously from a long way away mm. um, because you've, you've got to have your two quantum particles entangled to start with. Um, so it's not really an obvious step to take to see if you could get instantaneous 
feedback. But isn't it a wonderful idea, oh. though, if you could? You know, it's at the moment, it's science fiction. It's the kind of thing that authors like the great Andrew Dunkley, you've probably heard of him, he writes some great books, uh, write about. Um, <laughs> and um, that that's uh, that's the kind of stock in trade of science fiction at the moment. But yep. who's to say yep. that well, one day... We might know more about it that tells us that, yeah, what Misty has suggested could be done. My um, The one I'm writing at the moment has got quantum computers, quantum technology for time travel in it. So, Good. Yeah. Well, there you go. You've done it already. I, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. But that, that's that's how I always <laughs> that's how I always write. That's why it sort of meanders and I then have to try and figure out how to tie it all together. But, uh, Misty, that's a great question. Thank you so much for uh, sending it in and it's um, – Lovely to hear voices uh, in our uh, in our podcast. Now, Fred, let's move on to the next one. Uh, we have a voice, but we do not have a name. G'day, Fred and Andrew. I've uh, got a question, but maybe it's more of a request. I would like an explainer on the coordinate system used by astronomers to catalogue and share stellar phenomena. Uh, I know the world turns and the Earth revolves around our sun, so what coordinate system do you use that enables objects to be rediscovered, relocated or catalogued and shared with other astronomers who may live in another hemisphere? It's probably Astronomy 101, but I haven't done that yet. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, here we go with Astronomy 101. <laughs> well, that's your job, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yes, look, it's a great question, and it's one that's not that intuitive, particularly because the Earth is rotating. Mm. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that, I think it was last time or the time before, how you compensate for that. You, you essentially drive the telescope so it follows the sky uh, as the sky appears to rotate uh, over our heads. Uh, and it, it's a similar process with the... The, you know, the coordinate systems that are used. Basically, astronomers use this, essentially the same coordinates that we use on the Earth. The Earth is a sphere, yep. and you can imagine the sky is a sphere, a much bigger sphere, mm. uh, which is centred on the centre of the Earth. So whereas we have latitude and longitude on the Earth, on the sky we have something called declination, which is exactly like latitude. It is the distance above or below the celestial equator, and the celestial equator is just the projection of the Earth's equator out into space. So declination is how far away a star is from the equator, measured in degrees. Uh, and the other thing which is akin to longitude is something called right ascension. And you can think of that as being the angular distance uh, from a zero point in the sky, and that zero point has a special name. It's called the first point of Aries, Aries being the constellation of the ram. Uh, so it's a specific point in the sky, on the equator, actually, mm. from which you measure um, the angle, except that we actually usually call it a time rather than, a, than an angle, because 360 degrees is equivalent to 24 hours. And the reason why you want the time in there is that the Earth is rotating. Um, and so the time comes into it uh, very, very importantly. It's actually something called star time, which is slightly different from clock time. Uh, it's called sidereal time. And that, uh, when you combine this coordinate of the right ascension with the local sidereal time at the instant you're observing, you can then get a point in the sky where you point your telescope. Um, the, the other aspect of this that is mentioned by our anonymous caller is what about the Earth's rotation around the sun? And that, with, with stars, mo with most stars and galaxies, they're so far away that it makes very little difference. Mm. Um, but the nearer stars, and by those I mean ones nearer than roughly two or 3,000 light years. So that's quite a long way, but, you know, the galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter, so it's not that much of a fraction of the, of the galaxy. But out to that distance, there is an effect. As the Earth moves around the sun, uh, there's a slight parallax effect uh, as you're on one side of the Earth uh, at one 
point and then six months later you're on the other side of the earth until you get this slightly different view uh, of your star and you can effectively see the star apparently moving against the background of more distant stars and you can take that into account uh, it's actually it's just called the parallax motion of the star it's not easy to detect because it's so small yeah. mainly because the stars are so far away uh, it was 1839 before the first parallax was measured by dr bessel friedrich bessel i think it was uh, in berlin or hamburg i can't remember the details i should know that Never mind. Uh, Never mind. I, 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 I'm, you, you mentioned declination and right ascension. Uh, if we were to receive a signal from yeah. aliens, we would be able to use that to pinpoint where it came from. Exactly. You can pinpoint what direction it came from. So, for example, with the fast radio bursts, which aren't signals from aliens, they're, we think they're flare, flares on highly magnetised stars. But the first thing you want to know about that is what direction in the sky did it come from. Mm. Uh, and some radio telescopes, which are great at detecting these, are not actually that good at pinpointing it down. Uh, and that's why often radio astronomers work with astronomers using visible light telescopes to, to, to try and narrow it down to see if there's a flash in invisible light as well. Fabulous. All right. Um, hmm. We don't know who you were, but thank you for the question. It uh, yeah, made a for a question. fascinating discussion. It really did. Uh, and we we have got so many questions to get into, Fred. Uh, I, I can't believe how many have come in in the last couple yeah, of weeks. That's so great. <laughs> it's fabulous. But uh, yeah, it's I think we could probably do four or five episodes back to back of questions only, and we still would struggle to get through them. So hmm. uh, don't let that discourage you, though. We, we do love your questions, particularly the recorded ones. Um, saves me having to try and read, which I don't do very well. Um, but, yes, it's, uh, it's always good to hear your voices. And you can, you can certainly record your question through our uh, website. Uh, it's uh, spacenutspodcast.com. Click on the AMA uh, tab and you'll find the recorder there. If you've got a device with a microphone, kind of you know, like, like this one, maybe not quite as small uh you you uh, or you know even a, a mobile phone or a tablet something like that if it's got a microphone in it laptop computer uh you should be able to record and don't forget to tell us who you are it's yeah one of those yeah that's a real cheap nasty one that is uh but <laughs> um that's that's how it's done uh of course you want to do it the old-fashioned way uh i don't know what the price of a stamp is but you know that's an option too <laughs> We'll get it a couple of years from now. Uh, probably be quicker to send it out by, via a um, small spacecraft about 25 millimetres across. Uh, that brings us to the end of another episode. Fred, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, Andrew. Always good to talk and um, looking forward to the next time when we'll do all these questions or at least a good chunk of Yes, well, next, some next, great ones. next uh, episode's 230. We always seem to do a question episode on a round figure, so why not? Why not? Why not, indeed? Exactly. All right. Good to see you, and uh, we'll talk to you, talk to you soon. That's Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large from Space Nuts, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, your host. Thanks again for listening or viewing, as the case may be, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from bytes.com.